Thousands of sorely needed condo units have gone up over the past decade plus in this province. And to be sure, there's a housing crisis and everyone agrees we need more as fast as possible. But for all the engineering wonders of some of these buildings, 50 stories, glass and steel, do we need to think about making it all a bit more, well, charming? With us now on how to grow cities with, shall we say, greater civic appeal, let's welcome Mary Rowe. She's president and CEO of the Canadian Urban Institute and longtime architecture critic and urban affairs columnist Christopher Hume. And we're delighted to have you two back here in our studio. Let us start with, we're going to take a look at some pictures later on of some of the stuff that's going on and get your feedback on it. But Mary, start us with this. Can you define what the charm or character of a city is? No, you really can't. <laughs> and I just want to make sure right off the top that we talk honestly about that because charm is in the, the eye of the beholder. And I always worry, and I'm sure that my esteemed colleague to my left and I are going to have an animated conversation about this because there are lots of parts of cities that locals mm -hmm. would probably not use the term charm, but they would say it's theirs. Mm -hmm. It reflects who they are. It's come up as a result of whatever needs and aspirations they had. And so it has a kind of local charm. But what I want us to do is be careful to not sound condescending and judgmental. That's charming, that isn't. It's really got to be about authenticity and resonance with the local community. Okay. And, that, and I think you can do that. Okay, Mr. Condescending and Judgmental, let's hear from you on this. <laughs> I'm, 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 I don't know if that was meant for him. I handed but it, it right over. Yeah, you yeah, kind of yeah, did. No, it's true. Did. I, what can I say? What uh, do you feel you can define the charm or character of a city when you see it? Well, I know if I feel the city is charming or not. And to be honest with you, Steve, I've never thought charm is Toronto's long suit. Uh, I mean, we we have charming areas. Uh, there are charming neighborhoods. Cabbage Town is charming. Uh, the area around Roncesvalles is very charming. Young and Eglinton. This area that we're in right now, where I grew up, is very uncharming. Um, but 12, I, 12 years of LRT construction will do that to you. You know, I, I think that the Young and Eggington is now the sort of um, metaphor for the whole city. It's, it's a city of <laughs> constant construction. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. 1984. Instead of constant war, it's constant construction. Uh, these pretentious, over-designed condo towers, and behind it, acres and acres of low-rise, two-story, post-war housing that somehow manages to survive despite it all. Um, but charming is not a word I would use to describe Toronto. It's livable, mm -hmm. and, and we like it, and we're all here, but charming, no. Well, he gave a couple of examples of neighborhoods in the city that he thinks are charming. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add to that when you see charm? What do you think of in this city? Again, I think it depends on what people are looking for. You know, for me, part of what makes a city really interesting is uniqueness. So, and sometimes I would call that, in my case, I like grit. I like neighborhoods that have mixed use, different kinds of forms, different kinds of uh, design that's been put into there, not in a quite so tidy and thoughtful a way. Sometimes I worry, Chris, with charm, that we're talking about a postcard-like uh, you know, kind of uh, emblematic, this is a perfect city, versus you and I know, Toronto has all sorts of neighborhoods that are interesting, lots of surprises, and unique to those neighborhoods. And so whether, maybe charm is just too sentimental a word. I'm trying to find a word that's more descriptive of forward thinking, responsive to what people want. You know, if we go to Paris, let's say, uh, people would say Paris is a charming city. It's more than charming, perhaps it's harmonious. There are very strict rules about how tall a building can be, the materials that, that they have to be included in the building, that sort of thing, the uses even of the floors. Um, and it adds up to a sense of harmony uh, and sort of um, you feel comfortable there because you know... But they also have a lot of French people speaking French, which adds to the charm, right? <laughs> well, but yeah, can, yeah, I, but yeah. can I counter this and just say, let's take another city if we're going to do that, Washington, D.C. Lots of harmony in terms of the public buildings, but the really interesting parts of Washington D.C., as you and yeah, I know, and are the neighborhoods that have sparked up and are completely idiosyncratic and not sort of charming, but really interesting. But, but you know, I guess the thing is that cities have their public areas and their their sort of private areas, mm -hmm. and when we think about Toronto, we don't think about the neighborhood that I live in or necessarily Cabbage Town, those kinds of places that I mentioned, mm. even though it's charming. We think about what's happening at King and Young. We, we think about what's happening on Blur Street. We think about, you know, where the, where the baseball stadium is. The, the 
those parts of the city that belong to everybody, not necessarily just the people who own or who live in houses. Okay, there. follow up on that then. When you think about what's happening at Young and King or a Young and Egg or near the Sky Dome or what Rogers Center, whatever, when you think about that, what are you thinking about or referring to? You know, you just you just touched on one of the points I want to make, which is I believe that the city is under such um, uh, pop, uh, pressure to change. The pace of change is so fast that nobody, the, the, I should say not nobody, but we feel an increasing sense of alienation. We feel untethered. Uh, and when you just mentioned Sky Dome, Names, the names of, of public buildings is another example of that. Yeah. It started as Sky Dome, then it became something else, and now it's <laughs> Rogers Center. The O'Keefe Center became Hummingbird, and I don't even know what it is right now. <laughs> uh, everything is up for sale, everything is up for grabs. You know, they're going to move Ontario Place now. They're going to, you know... Even the Leafs don't play in Maple Leaf Gardens anymore. Exactly. Or in a place it's, named listen, Maple Leaf something. It's a supermarket. I know, we sound like you're a couple just, of fogies yeah, here. Can I, can I read this here? This is from a publication called Stories. Mm -hmm. S-T-O-R-E-Y. I write for it. Well, about to quote you. coincidence of coincidences, <laughs> I am about to quote from you. Oh, great. Here's a piece that Christopher really uh, recently wrote. And, uh, Sheldon, if you would, bring this up and I'll read along for those listening on podcast. The speed of change has reached the point where whole blocks can become an empty wasteland, terra incognita overnight. The city feels like a money-making operation run at the whim of an industry drunk on profit. Aided and abetted by local planners in Queen's Park, everyday buildings as well as important cultural institutions and whole ecosystems are up for grabs. It leaves locals not just dazed and confused, but angry, untethered and increasingly alienated. Except for the obvious landmarks, Union Station, City Hall, CN Tower, everything seems unnervingly temporary. Don't get too comfortable in your hood. Home or habits all could disappear at a moment's notice. Wow. He wrote that. He did. What do you think of that? <laughs> yeah, he's pretty damn eloquent. There's a reason he was a journalist for all those years. Well, again, you know, you're talking to two older white people who have lived here for a couple of decades. I moved around, but, you know, we need to talk to all sorts of other people mm -hmm. who come into the city. They may come in for an event, like they may go to see an event, a hockey game or a cultural event. They may go to the ballet and they're coming in from other parts. They may be visiting. Their experience of the city is quite different, I think, than people that are going to wring their hands and say, oh, it's just not the but way you know, it used to be. <laughs> just a sec, Chris. And I also think that we've got to be careful about I don't know if I agree with you about uh, that they don't come and look at certain parts of the city. I think there are lots of people that come to visit family, for instance, and they may be in Scarborough, and they may be in North York, and they may be in Weston, and they actually have landmarks there that are part of the fabric of that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I, I do think the challenge we've got is we're accommodating tens of thousands of people coming in every year. And how are we going to accommodate growth? And as you said in the preamble, this, this the Ontario government has taken a position about trying to open up the mm -hmm. capacity to build more units, and so there's going to be neighborhood change. Mm -hmm. And the, the challenge I think we face at the, at the Canadian Urban Institute across the country is how do you balance input from local folks who actually have a vested interest in the quality of the built environment and the need of the future people that are coming? Does, does our fear of the kind of change that you referenced in that excerpt that I read lead to and result in more nimbyism in this city where nobody wants anything built in their backyard? Well, I think it certainly encourages that. It sets the stage for, you know, nimbyism that's worse than we ever had before. But, you know, I, I think that Mary makes some good points, but I would say to her that the fact that I'm old and white and male has relatively little to do with what I'm saying because I look at neighborhoods like Thorncliffe Park, mm -hmm. which are very immigrant-heavy um, uh, neighborhoods, um, the neighborhood around uh, the Ontario Science Centre, mm -hmm. and those people um, who are probably not born in Toronto or in Canada feel strong attachments to their neighborhoods mm -hmm. and they don't want the changes that are being foisted upon them either. And I think the thing is that, of course, we all expect change and change can be good. I, I mean, I think change is absolutely desperately needed in a city like Toronto. But the, the type of, of change that we're experiencing here and the rate at which we are experiencing it makes people feel uncomfortable, and it makes them suspicious. Can I pick up on that with you, Mary? Because we're talking mostly about Toronto so far. Mm -hmm. But Ottawa's a big city, Mississauga's a big city, Hamilton's a big city, Brampton's a big city. Mm -hmm. Are the kinds of things we're discussing here 
the same issues in other big cities as well? You know, city. nobody wants change. It's an adage we can all just uh, drink coffee on and know is true. The question is, how do we actually encourage development to make some sense? I think that's part of what you're saying, Chris, is it's it happening is. so quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a perception people have. We were talking about how grumpy people are at the moment. And uh, it's because so much is happening. The construction is happening. Oh, there's also this crane and that crane. And what about, you know, and we've got inflation, all these other pressures. I think the dilemma post-COVID is that more people are able to work from home. Mm -hmm. There's tons of people that still go into their offices or to their workplaces. And so we still need vibrant neighborhoods and we need vibrant places where you work. And the balancing of that is gonna be tricky. And I think one of the vacuums we sometimes have is we don't have sort of public leadership that's positive about how you cope. I was thinking in London when they went through four and a half or five years of their enormous transit investment mm -hmm. and it was awful mm -hmm. when that was going on. But now they have the Elizabeth line. But now line. they have something gorgeous. Yeah. So how do we continue to encourage people to think in the longer term? What I hear from Chris is that there's a level of distrust, right? The, they won't trust that eventually we'll get through it? Go ahead, Chris. You know, what? I, if, if you look at development in Toronto and planning in Toronto, which is, you know, even more important than the architecture and everything else that we think of when we think of charm, mm. um, most of it's piecemeal. The, the city planning is one building at a time. Everything is planned and approved or not in mm -hmm. isolation of everything else. The one part of the city that has been done well, I would say, and which is uh, an example that we should all follow and which offers hope and optimism for the future of Toronto is the waterfront. Why? Because the wa because Waterfront Toronto started, you know, in 2020, no, 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 2000, sorry, 20, uh, 20 years ago. And they spent the first two or three years planning the whole waterfront from Scarborough over to Etobicoke. They divided it into a series of precincts. And the, the plan for each pre pre precinct was put out for an international competition. So we had the best planners in the world in Toronto working on the waterfront. Now, Doug Ford at the time was saying, it's a boondoggle, there's nothing going on down there, I haven't seen a thing in three years. No, because they had the whole thing planned out. And now, when the developers go down there, they know that on the site 35B, they have, uh, are entitled to build 35 uh, story building, and it must be made of sustainable material. That's why we have all those wood construction buildings down there. It has to be uh, lead platinum, blah, 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 blah. So the, 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 the Conditions are set, and it's planned as a community, as a whole unit, not just chink, chink, chink like that. Having said that, though, there, there. Uh, well, you tell me. I talk to people who say there's a sense around this town that everything's going up so much, so fast, all at once. The cumulative impact of it mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. is to give one a sense that. The place a little out of control right now. Mm -hmm. Do you not feel that? I, I mean, I do sense that people mm -hmm. like you are feeling that. There's a lot of sturm and drang about it. I think one of the challenges we've got, if you look towards the west side of the city and you see how all those condos suddenly seem to go up along the Gardner, mm -hmm. and you think, well, where was the public realm investment? Did we anchor those developments around shared services and shared amenities so people have a concern? Did we get the mm -hmm. schools right? Did we get the parks right? So I think there's an anxiety that's contributed to there. I, I would say, Chris, that one of the dilemmas we have the waterfront's taken a long time, and people have been grouchy about how long it's taken, right? Yeah, and it's been it's worth 40 the years. Race. And it's been, been and the question is whether we're here. But if you look at, for instance, Regent Park. 20 years. Because I'm talking about waterfront Toronto. Can I just make one oh, other quick right. point? Mm -hmm. The other thing they did that was quite brilliant, because it was an, a sort of semi industrial wasteland down there. I know because the Star Building was down there, right. so I when washed Street, it out of my used window. to tread those fields. Mm. Yes, trip over those fields. But the first thing they built that people could see was Sugar Beach, right. Sherburne Common, places like that. So people could suddenly think, oh my God. In other words, public they realm focused investment. on the public realm mm -hmm. and people could suddenly think, you know what, I could live here. Mm -hmm. I can suddenly see this in a different way. It's not just a place I drive through on my way somewhere else. It's a place I would like to stay now. And the emphasis is completely the opposite of what we're doing. And when poor John Tory decided he was going to build Rail Deck Park, 21 acres in the heart of the city, and then it turned out, oh no, you can't do that. The condo de uh, developers are, have already mm -hmm. already own the land. But so. isn't that one of the challenges you've got? You've said the waterfront, it was kind of an open tabula rasa, you could kind of, and they're taking their time doing it. Regent Park's another, where they raised several mm -hmm. sites and then built something up. The dilemma that you're speaking about, Steve, that most Torontonians are dealing with, is that they're in a neighborhood that's already built up in some way. And so how do you increase the density? How do you take main streets, for instance, that have 
interesting retail at the ground floor and have two or three stories above with interesting housing. Yeah, can we, we have, have some suggestions? convert those? We have some suggestions have here, actually. Let's have a look. I want to talk about a part of this city, and again, for those living outside the city, we're going to go to the junction now. The junction's in the West End. And we're going to first show, an, or, it's a bunch of different pictures of different uh, stuff going up. Mm -hmm. This is a photo from Gerlach called Junction Point. It's a mid-rise building, eight stories, 111 units, Dundas Street West, an auto body shop used to be on that site. So I guess we can infer from that that uh, this is a better use for that site than simply an auto body shop because lots of people are going to live here. Still under construction. For those who can't uh, see because you're listening on podcast, this is a bit of a triangle-shaped thing. It comes to a point. Okay, Christopher, start us off here. This is, a, a you know, not just simply a, a rectangle or a box or, you know, dropped into a, a neighborhood somewhere. It's a bit interesting looking. Eh? It certainly is. So it's what do you think of it? I like it. I wrote about this building uh, when it was first mentioned. Um, it's, it's got a lot, there's a lot of drama in this building. That, that point, you know, uh, you can't ignore that. It, it could be, almost could be dangerous. It, it's so sharp. <laughs> there's another building like this down on Mill Street. But the thing, the interesting thing here, Steve, is also that it's a mid-rise building, eight stories. That's a really nice height. And there are all kinds of opportunities in neighborhoods and on main streets where buildings like this one, or at least this, this size, uh, could be built. and enhance the neighborhood. There's room for retail at, at the street level. There's um, room for people to, you know, like people like me who, who, who have a house, you know, with all these bedrooms that are empty. Uh, I mean, I haven't been to the third floor of my house in six months because <laughs> I have no need to go there. Mm. So wouldn't it be nice if I could live in the neighborhood? I could stay there and live in a place like, I mean, they're so useful. But, you know, developers don't like them because there's not as much money to be made. They're, you know, they're just as, just as difficult and just as awkward. They require just as much approval and red tape and so on. But there's much less payoff in the end. Okay, let me show Mary the next picture here. This one, that one was Junction Point. This one is called Junction House. Mm -hmm. Same neighborhood, low rise, neon sign on the roof. Mm -hmm. Kind of cool. Uh, that's the, I guess, signaling the entry point to the neighborhood. You know, this is nine stories, uh, white and red brick. Is it bigger on the top than on the bottom? It kind of conveys that look mm -hmm. about it, that it's sort of, uh, it's not just a box. It's got some mm -hmm. context to it. I don't know. Mary, what do you think? Well, a couple of things. I mean, you know, talking about specific projects, and I don't know the specifics of either of these projects, but you can see that it's a bit brutal the way that you, that building is meeting the exit, what the houses are next to it. That's a little unfortunate, but it could just be the photo. Here's, I think, one of the challenges that Chris is speaking to. When you see this mid-rise stuff go up, mm. it's often very formulaic and pretty dull. Uh, and it can look the same repeatedly. It's as if there's this, this, and I, and I am a little more sympathetic that I think what happens is the development community gets a pattern and a design that they know the city will approve and it's just easier to get it approved rather than that kind of initiative, the first one you showed, which was kind of interesting, had some interesting architectural elements. That's the first thing. So I think variety is a really important thing okay. and I don't quite know how to get it. Okay, Sheldon, put that pick back up again if you can for a second because the idea, I appreciate that it's quite different from the houses next, bo next right. door. But the idea, I think, was to convey a kind of a gritty warehouse. Yeah, yeah, no, type no. Of thing. And listen, I don't want to be cr particularly critical of these individual projects. But one of the, just a sec, Chris, one of the dilemmas we have here is we can't see the context. And so Chris mm -hmm. and I are arguing so much of it is about public realm around it. One cautionary comment I have about these units and these developments, and I don't know what the answer is, but if you think about if there were prior to this, if there'd been sort of typical main street retail on the main floor, mm. and then it gets knocked down and you intensify and add housing units, you lose the housing units that were above the store that are generally affordable mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to put mom and pop independent retail into that kind of a development because of the, the, the cost of these things you tend to get chains okay. so I think we've got to think really thoughtfully about new mechanisms that will encourage independent well, retail to locate here. Let me put that to Christopher there's a new thing in town well I don't know how new it is but facadism uh -huh. where you take you know uh, in, in a way the what they used to call the Air Canada Centre now the Scotiabank Arena is facadism, right? Yep. You've got the old post office building at, yep. at street level, mm -hmm. and then up goes the big construction behind that. We've got one six blocks north of here on Montgomery Street, mm -hmm. where the old post mm -hmm. office is yep. the facade, and there's a big condo tower that's gone up behind that. It maintains the streetscape, the old streetscape, while at the same time building lots of big new stuff around it. What do you think? 
For the most part, it doesn't work. Um, but there are examples where it does. Air Canada Center is one of them, or it's not whatever it's called. Scotia Bank Arena. Scotia Bank no. Arena, yeah. uh, because uh, it's maintained at a scale that's big enough to still have the original impact. And there's mm -hmm. another stretch on the west side of Young, south of Wellington, the BCE place. Yes, it used to be called a whole row of 19th century retail. Uh, buildings, um, nothing, nothing especially fancy about any of them, but it works because it's a whole block. But too often, uh, it's just a question of some poor facade that's kind of been squeezed into the, like the Bay Adelaide Center. Mm -hmm. It's terrible. And you know, it's not fair, I don't think, to the new building, and it's not fair to the old building. They, yeah. they both end up with the worst of, of, of both worlds, it seems to me. We got another example of something here. It's a fake facade. Sheldon, quit putting this up, pick seven. This is mm -hmm. kind of trying to create fake character with a newly built, old-looking facade at street level and then a sort of modern, gleaming condo going up on top of that. This is College Street, just east of Spadina, mm -hmm. downtown Toronto, three stories, of a facade meant to look old, and the rest a new, new tower on top of that. Mary, what do you think? You know, these attempts at what we would call faux, it's a faux Faux facade. is better than fake. Yeah, but same okay. idea, though. Yeah. I, you, know, I, I, if, you, know, you know the old adage, the greenest building is the one that's already built. Would you rather see an adaptive reuse of an existing structure and intensify around it? Yes. Um, I think these are a little, they, they, it's so hard to do this well, eh, Chris? It's a mess. Yeah. The building you showed is a mess. But look, think of King Street West uh, yeah. from, let's say, Spadina East um, to what, University. Mm -hmm. A lot of those old um, warehouses, mm -hmm. uh, factories even, have been saved and they become office buildings, they become lofts, they become art galleries, they become restaurants. Okay, they are so flexible. Mm -hmm. And you know, I sometimes think that the best thing an architect could do is just to build flexible space. Mm. Because then it, it, it can, it can adapt. be repurposed, absolutely. Exactly, each, each generation, you know, want something different, the neighborhoods change. We don't have in industry happening anymore in, Tro in Toronto, but we can still use those buildings. There That's is... what's happening downtown. We're gonna have to see a repurposing of those, hmm. some of those commercial yeah. yeah, there is no bigger change happening in any neighborhood in this city than 50 meters outside the studio. Now. Exactly, mm -hmm. Young and Eglinton. One more picture here, Sheldon, picture number eight. Young and Eglinton, there are more cranes in the skies at Young and Eglinton than the entire city of Boston. So says Jennifer Keysmat. <laughs> Um, you know, when it's done, I mean, there are literally billions and billions of dollars worth of condo units going up at Young and Eglinton. There's a $12 billion LRT going east-west along Young and Eglinton. The subway is already there. They're redoing the subway platforms there. When it's done, if it's done, I mean, this should be pretty cool, don't you think, Mary, Absolutely. at some point? Absolutely, yeah. but boy, you have to be patient, don't you? You do. And yeah. we were talking, you know, about how people who are in this neighborhood and have been here for 20 years, their children have only known construction zones. So the level of patience that's required, what you just have to hope, fingers crossed, that, that the bets they made in terms of how they actually approve these various buildings, and if they've made sufficient investment in the public realm, that it will fit together. But that being said, <laughs> you know what? It'll open and it will feel not quite done and it'll feel too sterile. And then over time, time is the, is the friend of neighborhoods. Mm. Things. Time is the great healer it is the great of healer. neighborhoods. It will mm -hmm. evolve. But you know what, Steve? The work will never stop. That's the thing. I mean, it was, I remember when the Minto buildings were built across the road from here. Yeah. Yep. Huge outcry. And Mary's right. People got used to it and they did some nice things. They put that little uh, passageway in between yeah, the two buildings. Yeah, and yeah. a new tr um, uh, traffic light so people you could. You know what, Christopher? I remember David Crombie was a guest on this program just after those buildings were built, Mr. 40 Foot Bylaw, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, What do you think of those big skyscrapers they're putting up across the road? He says, I love them. In fact, I bought one. He moved yeah. into one. He yeah. did. Yeah. Yes. He liked it. Put that pick up again if we can, Sheldon, number eight, because this is this is sort of a futuristic look at, at what Young and Egg could look like. Uh, Lifetime Developments, Toronto Realty Boutique got, dot com, if you want to go online and look at, at more of this kind of stuff. I remember, somewhere in the middle of all that used to be a three-story <laughs> brutalist, the best of East German architecture, <laughs> where you used to go get your OHIP card renewed. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know what that building was called? It was called Ontario Government Building. <laughs> Now, how's that for a fancy, creative, <laughs> dynamic title? But and you, now we've got the Minto Towers there, which are so much better. Uh, and that's a good thing. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying it isn't, but I think that what, what the point here is that 
what what dictates um, development and growth in Toronto too much to 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 too great an extent is the value of property. Mm. Everything is reduced to its value as a piece of property. And that's why the construction will never stop. I don't remember exactly when the Minto buildings went up, but it was quite a while ago. I would think 20 odd years. Not, not quite that okay, long. 15 yeah. to 20. Okay. Yeah. And so that was one big, huge project. Now they're going on at Davisville all the way up. When the subway's done, the, the, the plaza, the, the, the whatever it is, on the um, northwest corner will have to go. And I'm sure they're already well, thinking... We're here about, on the southwest I, corner, and they got $2 billion worth of plans for this place. But, exactly. But, but this is not unique to Toronto. I'm no, not, no, I'm I not, lived in New York for years, and this is the same challenge. I'm not saying it there is. There was a concern about the real estate invest and the real estate community having too much say. Here's one of the things that we need to think about. Mm. How are we going to find ways to measure the cumulative impact mm. of this kind of intensification? And what are the kinds of things that we should be watching for? And similarly, what kinds of policy tools need to be put in place for the city to be able to exert some kind of measure of monitoring and control? And who's so going to be the new balance? mayor responsible for it yes, all? Yes, and oh yes, and but, what about leadership? <laughs> but I also think it's a large part about bureaucracies and systems and the, the civil service, you know. But don't you think that the other side of this coin is the fact that rents have gone through the roof in Toronto? Oh, sure. And there's a kind of insecurity, uh, uh, anxiety, Whatever. Everybody panic has. that people have. Mm -hmm. I hear it about it all the time. They don't know what, that they will be able to afford the rent next month. There are two rent strikes going on mm -hmm. in the city right now. Mm -hmm. That's the other side of this out of control development. And this, you know, real estate and, and housing um, are homes for people, it's, but it's been reduced to a commodity, like so many other things. Well, I suggest that we reconvene this group in 10 years and see how young and Eglinton and some other parts of the city have gone yeah. in the intervening decade. Yeah. What do you think, Ian? If I'm still alive, I'm in. <laughs> From your lips to God's ears. Christopher Hume, Mary Rowe, thanks so much for joining us here on Pleasure. TVO tonight. Pleasure. Thanks, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.